We invite you now to please stand for the entrance. Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled at seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human, so will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him, for they shall see something never told, 
and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him, no looks to attract the eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make the people screen their faces. He was despised, and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the sufferings he bore. Ours, the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet, he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace. And through his wounds, we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked a tomb with the rich. Though he had done no wrong and there had been no perjury in his mouth, the Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant great hordes for his tribute. He shall despite the spoil with the mighty, for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. in you. 
you I take refuge, let me never be put to shame. In your justice, set me free. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me, Lord. Father, I put my life in your hands, in your hands. In the face of all my foes, I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbors, and of fear to my friends. Father, Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man forgotten in men's hearts, like a thing thrown away. Father, But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My life is in your hands, deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Father, I put my life in your hands, in your hands. Let your face shine in your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong. Let your heart take courage, O oh, who hope in the Lord. Father, I put my life in your hands, in your hands. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heavens, we must never let go of the faith we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard 
Although he was the son, he learnt to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became, for all who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ became obedient for us, even to death. Dying on a cross, therefore God raised him on high and gave him a name above all other names. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. This is a lengthy gospel proclamation. I invite you to be seated if you wish during this proclamation. Jesus went out with the disciples across the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there and he and his disciples entered it. The place was familiar to Judas as well, the one who was to hand him over because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas took the cohort as well as guards supplied by the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns, torches and weapons. Jesus, aware of all that would happen to him, stepped forward and said to them, Who is it you want? Jesus, the Nazarene. I am he. Now Judas, the one who was to hand him over, was there with them. As Jesus said to them, I am he, they re re retreated slightly and fell to the ground. Jesus put the question to them again. Who is it you want? Jesus, the Nazarene. I have told you I am he. If I am the one you want, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost one of those you gave me, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, severing his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the soldiers of the cohort, their tribune, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. They led him first to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had proposed to the Jews the advantage of having one man die for the people. Simon Peter, in company with another disciple, kept following Jesus closely. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, stayed with Jesus as far as the high priest's courtyard while Peter was left standing at the gate. The disciple, known to the high priest, came out and spoke to the woman at the gate, and then brought Peter in. The servant girl who kept the gate said to Peter, Aren't you one of this man's followers? Not I. Now, <clears throat> the night was cold, and the servants and the guards who were standing around had made a charcoal fire to warm themselves by. Peter joined them and stood there warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus, first about his disciples, then about his teaching. Jesus answered by saying, I have spoken publicly to any who would listen. 
I always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews come together. There was nothing secret about anything I said. Why do you question me? Question those who heard me when I spoke. It should be obvious they will know what I said. At this reply, one of the guards who were standing nearby gave Jesus a slap blow on the face. Is there any way to answer the high priest? If I said anything wrong, produce the evidence. But if I spoke the truth, why hit me? Annas next sent him bound to the high priest Caiaphas. All through this, Simon Peter had been standing there warming himself. They said to him, Are you not a disciple of his? I am not. But did I not see you with him in the garden? Insisted one of the high priest slaves, as it happened, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had severed. Peter denied it again. At that moment, a cock began to crow. At daybreak, they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves, for they had to avoid ritual impurity if they were to e eat the Passover supper. Pilate came out to them. What accusation do you bring against this man? If he were not a criminal, we would certainly not have handed him over to you. Why do you not take him and pass judgment on him according to your law? We may not put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said, indicating the sort of death he would die. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. Are you the king of Jews? Are you saying this on your own, or have others been telling you about me? I am no Jew. It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my subjects would be fighting to save me from being handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom is not here. So then, you are a king? It is you who say I am a king. The reason I was born, the reason why I came into the world, is to testify to the truth. Anyone committed to the truth hears my voice. Truth? What does that mean? After this remark, Pilate went out again to the Jews and told them, Speaking for myself, I find no case against this man. Recall your custom whereby I release to you someone at Passover time. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? We want Barabbas, not this one. Pilate's next move was to take Jesus and have him scourged. The soldiers then wore a crown of thorns and fixed it on his head, throwing around his shoulders a cloak of royal purple. Repeatedly, they came up to him and said, All hail, King of the Jews, slapping his face as they did so. Pilate went out a second time and said to the crowd, Observe what I do. I'm going to bring him out to you to make you realize that I find no case against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, Pilate said to them, Look at the man. As soon as the chief priests and the temple police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him and crucify him yourself. I find no case against him. We have our law, and according to that law, he must die because he made himself God's son. When Pilate heard the kind of talk, he was more afraid than ever. Going back into the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? Jesus would uh, not give an answer, any answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you. You would have no power over me whatever, unless it were given to you from above. That is why he who handed me over to you is guilty of the greatest sin. After this, Pilate was eager to release him, but the Jews shouted, <clears throat> If you free this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who makes himself a king becomes Caesar's rival. 
Pilate heard what they were saying, then brought Jesus outside and took, it, and took a seat on a judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, Gabbatha in Hebrew. It was the preparation day of, for Passover, and the hour was about noon. He said to the Jews, Look at your king. Away with him, away with him, crucify him. What? Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. In the end, Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus was led away and carried the cross by himself, went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, on one, one on either side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had an inscription placed on the cross which read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. This inscription in Hebrew, Latin and Greek was read by many of the Jews. Since the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, the chief priests of the Jews tried to tell Pilate, You should not have written the King of the Jews. Write instead, This man claimed to be the King of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them four ways, one for each soldier. There was also a tunic, but his tunic was woven in one piece from top to bottom and had no seam. They said to one another, We shouldn't tear it. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. The purpose of this was to have the scripture fulfilled. They divided my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. And this was what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus there stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. Seeing his mother there with the disciple whom he loved, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, there is your son. In turn he said to the disciple, There is your mother. From that hour onward the disciple took her into his care. After that, Jesus, realizing that everything was now finished, to bring the scripture to fulfillment, said, I am thirsty. There was a jar there full of common wine. They stuck a sponge soaked in this wine on some hyssop and raised it to his lips. When Jesus took the wine, he said, Now it is finished. Then he bowed his head and delivered over his spirit. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want to have the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a solemn feast day. They asked Pilate that the legs be broken and the bodies be taken away. Accordingly, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the men crucified with Jesus, first of one, then of the other. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers ran a lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. This testimony has been given by an eyewitness and his testimony is true. He tells what he knows is true so that you may believe. These events took place for the fulfillment of scripture. Break none of his bones. There is still another scripture passage which says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Afterwards, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, although a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate's permission to remove Jesus' body. Pilate granted it, so they came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, likewise came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, which weighed about a hundred pounds. They took Jesus' body and, in accordance with Jewish burial custom, bound it up 
in wrappings of cloth with perfumed oils. In the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because of the Jewish preparation day, they laid Jesus there, for the tomb was close at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. On the eve of Easter, wars and conflicts in different parts of the world continue to kill and destroy. Peace looks elusive and retribution seems to be the order of the day. The world's in trouble. Governments are leading their people to the edge of the abyss. Commentators tell us to brace ourselves for even more uncertainty. To this, we must add to the mix that 40 or so national elections are scheduled in due course. China and Russia and North Korea seem to have teamed up against the West. We can't underestimate the ongoing effects of COVID-19 either. And I don't know about you, but we really still, the world that is, has not recovered from this virus. It seems everyone in the world is on edge. And statistics tell us that COVID-19 has caused across the world a great deal of people to somehow succumb to mental illness. The words of a former Prime Minister of Britain said it all years ago when asked about the greatest challenge facing a leader, Harold Macmillan replied, events, dear boy, events. In other words, there is one event after another. Even in our church, leadership is challenging. Look at Pope Francis who's trying to navigate a universal Catholic Church through some heavy resistance. Leadership is becoming harder and harder. Why? Because the world is changing. I bet Harold Macmillan could not have envisaged some of the events we are experiencing today. Vatican II got it right when it spoke of new ways for new times. This was about the church's engagement with the world. And this is still relevant today, more so than ever. So good leadership is needed more than ever in such a world and church today. Christians bring a perspective to the world because their lives are based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our world would be a better place, in my view, if our lives corresponded more authentically to the one who ultimately saves us all. It's not governments of whatever persuasion who save us. It is Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate Good Friday and we do so in a world that has tasted death in so many ways and continues to do so. Our taste of death is nevertheless palpable because we've also had a series of little deaths within our own lives. And they can be in the form, as I mentioned before, things like mental illness, job losses, insecurity, isolation, separation, racism, economic hardship, dislocation, challenges to our freedom, domestic violence. The list goes on and on. It will take the world some time to recover. We're not out of the woods yet, and perhaps the world will never be the same again. 
The cost in human and financial terms is enormous. Yes, death is all around us, and today, of all days, we embrace the crucified one, the one who has died, but also the one who has defeated death. Our Easter faith will reassure us tomorrow and on Easter Sunday that however difficult things may be, and they are very difficult today, the deaf will not have the last word. Death can never have the last word. It is never the end of the story. This Good Friday, Jesus dies, but not apart from his rising. The death has to happen today, but so does the resurrection have to happen tomorrow and Sunday. For one makes no sense without the other. Everything is in light of the resurrection. We are people of the resurrection. We're not people of death. And this goes to the heart of, of Catholic theology, the theology of life. That's why we're so strident on those things that you well know about. The most recent, of course, the introduction of Dr. Suicide, legislation to make it legal for a doctor to kill somebody. It's not the Catholic way. Not the Catholic way at all. Today is good. It is great. Jesus suffers death and so do we but we focus on the cross today and we stand at its foot. And as we stand at its, at its foot, we see Jesus not only accepting his suffering, but also see him bringing victory out of death. So this is a great day, because suffering and death is painful for us all. It is a corrosive power over us. We have all witnessed within our own families and amongst our friends, different levels of suffering. We know too how it can destroy our human hope. Yet here in the shadow of the cross, in the mystery of suffering, a new light is also cast on the reality of death because Jesus heralds a new era. In the words, it is accomplished. In his dying, death is destroyed. His death promises us life. This is our faith, and we're invited to embrace it with all our strength this Good Friday, on this great Friday. Our Saviour today delivers us from the cold embrace of death and delivers us into the warm embrace of a life that lasts forever. So I do pray that the message of today will keep us all grounded. The truth is that we cannot be full unless we are first empty. And I suspect the world is empty right now. Empty, running on no fuel. In other words, the broken, dead body of Jesus was not in the tomb. He had risen from the dead. The emptiness of the tomb is where we are today. And there will come a time soon when our emptiness will be filled with hope. Our tanks will be filled again they will be full again. That's Good Friday. Yes, we feel empty still, but Good Friday helps us to reflect on this emptiness. For emptiness is surely temporary, and our risen Lord wants to fill that void. 
After Good Friday, my friends, let's not forget that Easter is around the corner. And after the tomb, the empty tomb, comes new life. No need to despair, therefore, in what looks like an absolute disaster today. The hope is being restored. In the meantime, we hold firmly onto our Lord, who reassures us that, that all will be well. Settle down, settle down, all will be well. That's the truth. That's what we believe. May God bless you and your loved ones in these strange but holy times. Traditionally on Good Friday, we have a Holy Land appeal. This is something that the Vatican organizes throughout the world. We're part of the worldwide community. So that the collection money that we receive today goes to the Vatican and they distribute that to the Holy Land and the places where needed. There are also envelopes on each of your pews and in the church. If you wish to take an envelope home with you and bring it back and place in collections in the future weeks that will also be contributing to that particular fund. I invite you to please stand for our solemn intercessions. For the Holy Church, let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, 
to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. So for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on, on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Tim Harris and for all bishops, priests and deacons of the church and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 For catechumens, let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. people. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church 
that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. believe in Christ. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ, that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. For those in public office, let us pray. For those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever living God in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour we pray on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God, the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. I invite you now to come forward to reverence the cross. You're invited to bow or kneel rather than touching or kissing. Thank you.
invite you to please stand. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I invite you to kneel or be seated, be seated for the distribution of communion.
I you to please stand for our prayer after communion and our blessing. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.